21st Century Research Library Collections. Remarks by Barbara Dewey, Thomas Leonard, and Wendy Pratt Luger at the 160th ARL membership meeting, convened by Deborah Jacobs. So, saving the best for last, and it's always a challenge to get people to come to the final session, so I'm delighted to see some of the people here. It's my pleasure to introduce this program on 21st Century Research Library Collections. Uh, my name is Deborah Jacobs. I'm the Rita D. G. Leonardo Holloway University Librarian and Vice Provost for Library Affairs at Duke University and co-chair with Tom Leonard of the Task Force on 21st Century Research Library Collections. The task force was formed in the fall of 2010, which was quite some time ago, uh, convened during 2011 and presented its report to the Transforming Research Library Steering Committee this past January. Uh, as I mentioned, Tom Leonard was co-chair and the following colleagues have served on the task force. Sharon Farb from UCLA, Fred Heath from the University of Texas at Austin, Tom Hickerson from the University of Calgary, Wendy Luger, University of Minnesota, Rick Luce from Emory, Greg Rashke from North Carolina State University, Jay Schaefer from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and Chris Avery, who was the ARL visiting program officer for this, uh, for this group and of uh, absolutely central value to our work. Um, Sue Bachman and Judy Rutenberg were staff liaisons. Uh, all of you have received a copy in your packet of the report, um, and additional copies have been made available. Um, if you were expecting a long white paper on the future of 21st century research library collections, obviously you've noticed that is not what this is. This, uh, as we began our work, we realized that the topic of 21st century collections really bleeds into every area of libraries. And as you can tell from the report, we tried to um, highlight certain elements of uh, the topic, um, not as a kind of prescriptive document, but more as a uh, suggestion of some of the areas that we're going to have to be paying close attention to. Um, the program, um, well, our goal was to present uh, what we see as a general landscape and um, then collectively define the actions we need to take. The program this morning is engaged, is designed to engage all of you in a clicker exercise, which you have heard so much about and I know you've been looking forward to. Uh, first by looking at some key issues and then we'll hear from two of our colleagues who will speak um, on rather different topics that are related to this overall uh, issue of 21st century collections and share their perspectives and a call for action. I'll go ahead and introduce them briefly and then we'll uh, get to the uh, audience participation part of the presentation. Wendy Leger is the University Librarian and McKnight Presidential Professor at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. She'll talk about her experience balancing the local portfolio of investments related to content and collections and developing multi-institutional models for collective decision making. These two themes are converging and they prompt us to develop a new model for conceiving of and articulating our roles as stewards of content. The University of Minnesota Libraries is restructuring and rebalancing resources to position itself for this new context. Barbara Dewey, Dean of University Libraries and Scholarly Communications at the Pennsylvania State University and also a member of the Reshaping Scholarly Communications Steering Committee will focus more deeply on the report's contention that new pricing models and new metrics for measuring and valuing the contributions of authors, editors, and reviewers will create opportunities for ARL intervention to move the market in a more advantageous direction for our community. Now, before we uh, get into the actual audience participation, Judy Rutenberg is going to give you your instructions. They're not very difficult, so. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll have a clicker. Um, uh, the, for this next part, Deborah is going to show you a series of slides, um, statements drawn from the report, and ask you to um, vote on a pity. <laughs> Likert scale. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> as to, in the context of kind of our co collaborative and collective action, um, whether these statements are urgent, important, or desirable. There's no opportunity to say they're not important at all. <laughs> <laughs> so one, two, and three across the top. Um, when Deborah finishes reading the statement, a 10 second timer will start. So if, you click, if you click in advance of that, if you um, pre click, it will still be recorded. If you click more than once, um, only your last vote will be recorded. So. so, the test, do you want to do the test vote? And the test question. Um, and the test question is would you like to read them? Or okay. Go ahead, you read them. Um, the importance of this session ending on time. <laughs> on a scale of one to three. Which is one? Which is three? Which, which is one and which is three? One is urgent. urgent? <laughs> yes, our speakers are at somewhat disadvantage. <laughs> we can't see this. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Really? That's <laughs> They are. Yeah. Okay. All right. Calm down, everyone. Calm down. So, uh, just so you know, there are nine of these statements. There aren't 30 or 50, something like that. There will be nine of these statements. And uh, at the end, we'll have a kind of summary before the speaker. We'll show a summary before the speakers. OK, number one, coordination and new strategies are needed to balance demand-driven acquisitions with continued need for broad and deep collections. Interesting. Okay, number two. <coughs> Local and shared investments to support management and preservation of data and digital assets are needed. <laughs> oh, okay. Very good. Okay, number three. The enduring need within the library for deep subject expertise will increasingly be met by teamwork and cross-institutional partnerships. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's hard to digest it all, so we'll, we'll make this available to everyone after the meeting. Okay. The data that live on the digital device of the scientist or humanist today is moving to the library server tomorrow. <laughs> R. You mean R? Okay. Uh, all right. Next one. Publishing output will continue to increase, and publishers will experiment with pu new publishing models that recognize the contributed value of authors, editors, and reviewers. Pricing. Pricing models. What did I say? Did I say that? The natives are resting. Yeah. <laughs> More choices. <laughs> okay. In the middle of the road. Okay. Next statement. Collections resources will increasingly be allocated to the development of discovery tools. People are thinking too hard. 
just need to respond. <laughs> they are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. From the gut. All right. I've lost track of where we are, but two more. All right, table 15. What is it? Share it with the whole class. <laughs> Libraries will incorporate sophisticated data analysis and cost modeling techniques into their operations. Okay, the open content movement will continue to challenge the commercial market. More collaboration is needed to transform scholarship and reshape the marketplace. <laughs> Big surprise. Yes. Is that the last one? Yeah. Yeah. Is that the last one? Oh, stewardship of an institution's unique assets is an increasing priority. Preservation of born digital materials would create a new dimension to special collections. <laughs> zero, zero. Okay. I think that's the last one. Is that the last one, Judy? No. Okay, so uh, realizing that this could open up a can of worms, are there any questions or comments? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we want to start our speakers at 10.30, no later than 10.30. I mean, we can start any time, but we thought we would um, give you some time to react or uh, respond. So there are a few minutes. Stunned silence. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Oh yes. Is there a summary, uh, Craig? Oh, top three. Okay. What is it? Uh, local and shared investments to support management and preservation of data and digital. Open content movement. And uh, special collections. Okay, any surprises? No? Deborah, just oh, yeah, a, surely. an observation. It's been only 11 years since ARL focused on special collections. And at that point, the special collections librarians wanted our attention. And it, once they got it, they weren't quite so sure <laughs> that they really wanted it, especially when David Stamm told them about how he'd like them to work differently. Yeah. But it is obviously a prime uh, responsibility mm -hmm. for all of us, and we're all focusing and making a much higher priority and much more central to what we're doing. I just want to reinforce that, that often when we talk about special collections, our folks in special collections think it's just about them. <laughs> and when I look at special collections, it's about uh, managing all of our unique collections across the entire corpus of the library. Okay. And uh, I think as we grapple with that, that's going to be an interesting continuing discussion. Uh, it, many of the, our special collections folks think it's totally within their realm, and we've got to figure out some way of sort of blowing that more open. Good comment. This is for Tom. Okay. Any other comments? Um, was this useful? 
Yeah, interesting. interesting. Any surprises? I was surprised by the responses to number one, where coordinating new strategies didn't seem to be urgent. Mm -hmm. It strikes me as more than urgent. That got only 36% urgent. I think, though, it may be the the narrowing as the statement was continued. Yeah. That may have driven some of the response. The tables near where I was perching um, were grumbling about, why don't we have a four or five vote? And that might have made it more difficult to tabulate, but I, I heard that as important. Okay. Uh, Wendy? So, let me start with a question. How many of you came with baggage? <laughs> <laughs> so the baggage joke was, was serious, actually. Um, and uh, I think what I want to talk about, and, and uh, Deborah mentioned that we're undergoing some restructuring of the thing, and it's nothing too dramatic, but it is all about some changing concepts. And uh, and bring a lot of baggage to the concepts that I want to talk about today. So I'm going to be doing kind of an overview of um, the report in a way, uh, but trying to get at some of the fundamental shifts that relate to investments, that relate to how we make decisions, and above all, relate to how we strategize and how we get that strategy. And to keep in mind throughout that that these sort of conceptual changes have profound impact on collection budgets, how we define collection, how we think about uh, the roles and autonomy of our staff. So there's going to be some profound changes there. And also the skills that are needed, especially working in a collaborative environment. So when I talk about this with, with my staff locally, um, they get really scared. They think somehow we're diminishing the importance of the collection. So I have to repeat over and over again that uh, collections are a core asset. We're not changing that. We have a fundamental role with respect to procurement and providing content. But that what's changing is that context and how we think about the strategies for decisions and uh, the investments. Now, early on in the report, there is this statement that is really uh, at the heart of what I've uh, highlighted here and there. Um, but we have to shift our thinking from purely focus on collections, as we used to know them, our baggage, to thinking about them as, as, as products, shift to think about them as a component in a much broader um, the academy of, of knowledge resources. And that to do that, the real imperative is to begin to shift to thinking about multi institutional models. So that's, that's fundamentally what I want to talk about. If you begin to work in a multi-institutional model, what has to change? And I want to focus on, on two elements. And, and in the task force, I made the mistake of saying it was a paradigm shift. And I was quickly informed that was not the case, which is probably true. It's not a paradigm shift of that magnitude. So I'm going to use the word rubric. But we need a way of thinking about new customs, new rules of engagement, and engagement, maybe an injunction to all of us to think about operating differently. So the two things I want to talk about are, first of all, how to get our local house in order to prepare for a multi-institutional work. And then secondly, how we think about operating in that global context and how those two things come together. I'm going to draw on to start with um, some slides I really love from Mark and Dempsey, and they've evolved uh, a lot over time. But he proposes these four quadrants um, of the kind of information space. So in the upper left hand, you have um, our traditional collecting. We purchase things, we acquire things, we increasingly license things. In the lower left hand, we have special collections, um, the unity. In the right hand at the bottom, we have the institutional assets. And then finally, we have the open web. And you'll see he has these two axes of things held in lots of collections and things held in few. 
and then the level of stewardship, lower harm. So that's pretty much the traditional model, if you will, where, where we put our assets and where we seem most important. But he predicts uh, that in five years' time, and of course he started this model a few years back, so we're probably already where he's put the, the gold box, but we see this shift from what we purchase to licensing. Then they're done that, right? Then when it talks about our special collections, and when the comments earlier are really on point for this shift, that we're seeing much more importance given to high stewardship for those special collections, for the unique things that we can contribute to the academy. The institutional assets in the lower right were increasingly called upon to be stewards of that content. We didn't build it, we didn't acquire it, but they would like us to steward it, whether it's data, whether it's personal collections that want to be shared, whether it's learning objects, uh, research materials, library being called upon to steward, manage, archive, whatever word you want to do. And then when it comes to the open web, and there were some comments uh, certainly with respect to public policy yesterday, that we see increasingly an emphasis on libraries trying to understand how we can distribute that responsibility for stewardship move into the high stewardship category. Now Lorcan takes this model though and talks about it's not enough to make these shifts. You have to be able to declare those shifts to others if you want to work collectively. So he talks about discovery in two ways. One that the things that you acquire, you're bringing them into your environment and adding them to your discovery services. The discovery layer we're all building, right? But with respect to what's unique, he suggests that we have a really strong responsibility and stewardship, whatever you want to call it, to push it out, to position what we have that's unique, whether it's special collections or data or learning objects, you name it. Those things that we're contributing to that set of components of the knowledge environment, that we have a responsibility to ensure they are discoverable for the future. So that is a different dimension to thinking about collecting, not only the ships, but what our role is. So from a local perspective, and this is overgeneralizing and perhaps restating the obvious, we see collection development moving much more into a new genre of acquisition types. Uh, we see this uh, expansion of procurement strategies, you know, paper-driven acquisition, but also new forms of getting onesies when we need it whole range of things. We also have then the challenge of with this myriad procurement options, how we create a coherent <coughs> discovery environment. So if it's sort of the old adage, you know, if you have it and nobody knows about it, it can't be discovered, you really have um, that kind of question. And with respect to collection management, we're talking about expansion of stewardship, that those quadrants that we're from this point of view. But there's another important shift here, and that is to say that there is not always a one-to-one -one correlation between development and management or stewardship. And if there are any um, members of our task force uh, in the audience who'd like to make any comments or uh, come on up, that would be fine. I have a question for Wendy. Um, you said that you've been introducing these ideas in your institution and you've been doing some reorganizing to uh, reflect them, I assume. Could you tell us a little bit about the nature of that reorganization? Sure. Um, it's, it's not terribly dramatic on paper. Um, We've essentially taken what used to be called cataloging and it's been redesigned as part of IT as a data unit. Thinking about that so much of the data that fuels discovery we don't create anymore. Uh, yes, we do some, but a good deal of it we don't. And But very much at the heart is thinking about uh, positioning our collections, and that has to be done with the data and inserting our, our data in the right discovery systems. So that's one piece of it. The other, and we had the usual portfolio of, you know, someone in charge of collection development and someone in charge of collection management and uh, preservation um, and resource sharing. So we're, uh, there's going to be a new division that will include um, 
acquisitions and e-resource management that is all about sort of the efficiencies of procurement, including resource sharing, seeing resource sharing as just one more form of procurement. Um, and there will be a new AUL over all of that. And we're in then intentionally including a content development uh, uh, functionality or capacity that's not really publishing per se, although it may do that, but it's coalescing all of the consulting work we do for people who are creating content. So I think those two elements have a lot to do with the, the content and um, uh, collections concepts. I think what's been interesting recently, though, is we were merging two libraries and we realized, and we tried to use a collective model to make decisions. And it was damn hard for a couple of reasons. Not, not just the politics of it, you know, and, and uh, lots of angry letters over that, but, but things about uh, the quality of our data. So if we want to determine the scarcity of, of our forestry collection, um, you know, guess what? We, we all have created some pretty lousy data, and we can't match to find out if it's scarce or not or if it's uniquely held or not. So that was one thing. But then realizing the kind of portfolio that, that I talked about and how do, we, how do we now make a commitment that we're going to keep forestry resources around for the long haul. And yes, you can declare it in the OCLC record with your intention for retention, but trying to make explicit decisions at a macro level about a collection, I think, is the next frontier. So um, part of what we're talking about here is how to help people make understand the collective and help go towards macro decision making as opposed to onesies as we, as we deal with you know, the challenges of space, the challenges of a deteriorating collection, and you could, you could fill out the list. Well, in addition to moving the oldest eastern puma, which is now extinct, out of the library, <laughs> that was one one thing I did the first year. Uh, <laughs> that we we did do a reorganization. Um, we had a retirement, uh, and at um, Penn State, um, when I got there. Uh, the organization was based on geography more than anything. So there was an a, a associate dean over all of University Park, which is the flagship, and then an associate dean over all of the campuses. And so um, with this retirement, uh, basically I didn't have as, as many philosophies as Wendy. Uh, I had some practical philosophies, one of which was we were facing a major budget cut, and so I didn't think it was a good time to expand and fill the position. But having said that, we decided to um, focus on our one library, many locations uh, vision. And uh, so the associate, there's four associate deans, and um, one of them who had campuses now uh, works with undergraduate services, our new knowledge commons. Uh, still has campuses, but has the able um, leadership of Chris Avery to do that. And then we have uh, Associate Dean, who many of you know Mike Furlow, who is a rising star in this area for uh, research and scholarly communications. And his portfolio includes digitization and also special collections, because there's a direct link there. There's so much digitization that's going on, as well as the um, relationship with University Press and uh, data curation repository services. And uh, then our uh, other associate dean has uh, responsibility for um, access, collections, and um, more of the um, higher level research services with subject librarians. She also has acquisitions and um, cataloging and uh, information technology, but there's some practical reasons for that. So. I see this as definitely a work in progress, and we're doing an assessment or, of the organization in terms of how it serves the users um, and how it um, moves us forward strategically, and so that's going to happen this summer. And if any of you have some good ideas about organizational assessment, I would really love to hear about it. Thank you. Rick and Jay are in the room, and if there's anything you want to say about the collections that, uh, under the influence, so to speak, have worked on this that you did. Uh, 
Thanks, Tom. Actually, there is, but I want to speak not as a member of the committee, but more as an independent agent, if you will. Um, first of all, I really appreciated uh, Wendy's uh, ability to sort of take something that's been very murky, we've struggled with, and put a model up that we could start to relate to. I thought that was very helpful. To be fair, in my own observation, I think that the, the, uh, the task force, quite frankly, the collections group, task force, whatever we want to call it, has, has really struggled uh, with this question. Uh, and, and so it's left me um, with a, a sense very much that the final report produced or, or the, port, the report we have in front of us is, uh, is, quite, is quite frankly a watered-down document. And, and so I'm kind of scratching my head asking, um, I think, a larger question, which is the role of these task force task forces, uh, how much of that role really is about leadership versus how much of the role is kind of reflecting um, a consensus of where the organization or some part of the organization of ARL is at any given point in time, kind of case in point. So the, it was fun to have the clicker exercise. Um, if we thought about that as a, as a vector in terms of the issues, prioritizing the issues and which ones we might use to put attention to or, or resources uh, toward, um, you start to stand back and say, so do we get 50%, do we get 70%, what percent do we need before we really get engaged as an organization around a particular issue? I want to contrast that with the report we heard from Jim Williams yesterday. Jim got up, talked to us about some problems that are very serious, and, and, and said definitively, we're going to have a plan, we're going to call on you, and we're going to go forward. And you know what? I believe they're going to have a plan. They're not going to wait for 70% of us to agree that we've got an issue before we decide to call congressmen or, or whatever it is. We're going to get a heads up, um, and, and we're going to we're, hopefully we're all going to move very, very quickly in, in that area. So the question I'm trying to raise, I think, is more of a, a question about how we take difficult issues like this and what is the role as an organization and as, a, if you will, subcomponents in, in committees uh, in the organization in terms of providing leadership and direction versus really trying to echo kind of uh, this is a consensus of where we're all at, which really doesn't take us very far, but perhaps or perhaps not as useful in terms of being a measuring stick for where we are today. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll wind up this, uh, this monologue just by saying I don't think the report pushed us far enough, and um, I think there's challenges that still remain on the table. Thanks. Other members of the team might want to respond to that. Yeah, I, you know, I, I at, at one level, uh, understand uh, what you just said. Um, I think there's there's an interesting conundrum here in that we all have different local situations at home, right? So, you know, part of my concern in trying to articulate the local versus the collective is that you got to get your house in order at home. And we may each have very different constraints. You know, I used to have a provost that said, thou shalt not touch the collection budget for anything other than content. Um, you know, and that's, that's, uh, that's an injunction that really is a, a deal breaker. I found it fascinating that the statistics survey is now going to ask us to declare how much we put in collection support. I've done those surveys before, and people will say, don't quote me on it, and, and you know, pretty scared about that. So, so one level, I think it's very hard to give a mandate to us collectively until we can deal with the diversity and complexities and heterogeneity we all have at home. That said, I mean, why I liked the word rubric is that it does include not just a framework but an injunction or a call to action, which I think is very much what Jim gave us yesterday. But maybe we didn't say it as boldly enough. Um, uh, but I think we have an opportunity, given some of the challenges ahead of us. We're probably all doing instances, shared storage or shared you fill in the blank. But how do you think about it as a whole? So I, I, I see your point, but I think there's enough there that's meaty that can get the conversation going. I think uh, something that... Um perhaps was missing in our discussion so far this morning, but came up in the RLLF session, which was excellent. And that is that, and it relates to the work ARL does in helping us articulate with um, the university central administrations that we all work with, these concepts, these, these models, these rubrics, uh, and 
the issues that we all face. And so I think in that sense, uh, we can really move forward. The other thing that really struck me, too, in the, the scenario meeting uh, this morning was a, a, a real focus on um, helping us communicate with our librarians and staff about the changing expertise. We talked about that yesterday. And so I hope that in any of these task forces, we get at what is needed from a human resource point of view, um, not just in our profession, but um, in partnership. Uh, so those were a couple of things I wanted to reflect. Um, I just, I wanted to offer a response to, um, to Rick. Uh, I, I think, and I'm going to overstate the point in order to make it, um, I, I think that calls to action um, are a lot easier to make uh, when you have a common enemy outside of yourself. Uh, so somebody is about to open 108, we must stop that. It's a lot easier than what the hell are we going to do about this collective collection thing. It's like really complicated and it is us. So the, the Rubik's Cube model is, is, I mean, it's cute, but it's also useful because it's really complicated and there are so many moving parts and we're the ones moving them. Um, so I think that's why associations, not just this one, adopt different modalities for dealing with different kinds of issues and the Rubik's Cube, which as a child I always hated, um, and, and the reason I hated it is the damn thing was never over. You know, that's why I don't like to play chess either. I mean, it just goes on forever. Um, same with the Rubik's Cube. So the modality for dealing with that kind of a problem is, is a very different modality from the modality with dealing with the kind of problem Jim and Jimmy were telling us about yesterday. And, and each of them are appropriate under varying circumstances. Now, to Rick's point, I do think at some point you need to realize when you've exhausted a particular modality and maybe choosing a different one is appropriate and, and maybe that's what Rick is giving a certain amount of voice to because you know, those of us who've been around for a while have been talking about the collective collection for an eternity or a seeming eternity and we still are. Um, but you've got to kind of verbalize it. Just keep verbalizing it. Keep verbalizing it, and get it get it more and more right as you do that. Which is why your Rubik's thing is is not bad. I got to say one thing, but just a weird little story at Michigan. Um, I can't remember who had a Rubik's cube on their desk, and never could solve it. But every morning we would come in and somebody overnight had solved it. <laughs> so the, the university put in a, a video camera to see what was happening. <laughs> and they played the video in the morning and you saw these hands. But we didn't know who did it. <laughs> That's great. I, uh, Rick, I, I respect what you've said and, and I understand. Um, and we had discussions about that in the, in the task force meetings. I think also that kind of echoing what Brian said, the range of issues we're dealing with are, I mean, it's like a tapestry that you pull on one thread and things start to unravel. You don't control all the pieces. I mean, to really mix metaphors. Um, and, and so it, it was intended as a report to call attention to the issues and, and call for collective action, much as we tried to do with the fall forum the urgency of collaboration. So, um, Suzanne? Um, Suzanne Thorne from Syracuse. Um, having been at Indiana uh, University and Syracuse, two very, very different institutions in size, we also have um, issues in how large our collections are and who our peers are and who we compete with. And there are all of these things as well as the provost who offers um, um, an ultimatum that is, is difficult. Um, but going back to Rick's point, um, I think I like Wendy's getting ready, getting our own house in order, and I'm wondering if that might be a place to start a call to action uh, in elements that we could um, we could begin to assess and get statistics for, et cetera, for our own houses that wouldn't 
get into some of these other nasty areas. Tom Hickerson, University of Calgary. Um, and I'm also uh, a member of the committee. And um, I want to um, speak in sympathy to the points that Rick raises. And I, I think in some ways, um, and, I, and I really don't ex accept the dichotomy of, of the enemy out there, uh, because I think to some degree we have the enemy within and that we are actually doing things that we shouldn't be doing. That in fact, that this paper tells us that that's not the image we should be driving for, and yet we're doing things that are actually perpetuating that image. And so I think his call to action, and to some degree, you know, turning on ourselves, uh, in the sense that because we are the ones that can correct it, that's our job, and we need to charge ourselves to do that. Speaking from a, a more practical standpoint, uh, perhaps, than uh, philosophical, um, this spring we have run a series of focus uh, groups uh, among faculty. Uh, talking about these very issues, and in fact, I took the liberty of using uh, the earlier paper that this uh, committee produced as uh, sort of prompts uh, to to converse with faculty, uh, as well as having internal discussions. Um, and it was interesting to me that almost without exception, uh, whether the faculty were humanist or scientist, uh, social scientist, and maybe it uh, speaks to the, regardless of the discipline, it was the people who were interested in the library. Maybe others would have a different perspective. But almost without exception, the responses and the level of conversation was related to, um, you haven't purchased what I need, or the depth of the collection is not what I need, or you've moved my books off campus into storage. So I think there is this huge disconnect um, locally and maybe collectively uh, between where libraries believe uh, we need to be and actually where things are going, regardless of whether we believe it needs to be there or not, and where faculty are. And we have to find a way to bridge that gap. So I wonder if other people have had similar or different experiences in talking with faculty? We may be hearing a similar experience. Uh, just a, a similar experience. Maybe it's a little funny, too. Um, we had a series of Deb Carver, University of Oregon, series of focus groups with faculty very similar to what you had at Brown. And uh, we've been trying to build this uh, collective collection for several years now. And one of our objectives was to establish a thresh threshold of um, duplicate copies within the collective. And uh, I brought this question up with our faculty, and they said, oh, we can totally accept a threshold of copies, as long as we're one of the ones who owns the book. So I think we, we are um, finding that to be true. One of the reasons why I really like this paper is that it gives us an opportunity to kind of rethink our professional identities, which have, up to this point, um, been very tied into what we can do for our own faculty. And I think by thinking about a, a we're actually making, we're entering into a much more complex decision-making environment um, that will be more challenging. And I think once our subject specialists begin to think about it from that perspective, perhaps they will begin to develop, or we'll all begin to develop a new sense of professional identity that will be a, um, an incentive for us to move in this direction. So that's one of the reasons why I really like this paper and I like the dialogue today. Um, if I could say something about the uh, moderation of the four-page report, I would point out that I don't think there really 
is anyone in ARL who is arguing for a position that we might call radical. Um, you might compare what you believe about collections and views with Lisbeth Rousey, a major philanthropist, a good friend of libraries, many institutions. Um, she would like us tomorrow to revise the Byrne uh, Treaty to, of course, change copyright, um, to uh, very soon have a national licensing scheme so all material can be shared. In her view, and I'm sure you know the public view, um, you know, uh, JSTOR is as evil as Elsevier. And we're part of the world that builds a wall around information. Elizabeth is a wonderful friend of libraries, and she should be invited to ARL to speak. Then we would hear a radical view. Uh, we just had her at Berkeley, and it was stimulating and wonderful, and I encourage all thinking along that line. However, when we go home to do our job year after year, we can't all be seen as sort of stuff. Um, we're, if I can be allowed a little more minutes, a, little, a few more minutes, why don't we take the two last people standing? Thank you. So, <laughs> okay. So, on a totally different topic, um, not in terms of, of the dialogue we've just had, uh, David Ferriero raised a point. I don't think David is, the, is in the room today, and so I wanted to re repeat his, his point from the committee meeting the other day, is, is that while we reference uh, discovery for museum and archival holdings, um, this actually is assuming a collection that is actually very sharply defined by a fairly traditional vision of, of libraries. And in fact, our users have a much more holistic view of the whole range of documentary resources that they use in their, in their research and knowledge creation. So that's a different point. And last comment or question. I think collective collections are inevitable. Um, I think getting your local house in order doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a good synergy between the local needs and the collective needs. However, I, I also think that our faculty are very conservative. They don't like change. And so when we moved to one selector and a combined uh, collection for Slavic and East European studies, and that selector was at Columbia. It pissed off the faculty at Cornell. I mean, they really felt that they, that this collaboration was about less than more. Um, a year later, and Rob has been just stunning as uh, reaching out to the Cornell faculty, um, engaging both Cornell and Columbia faculty in uh, new forms of, of information that are being provided on both campuses. We did a survey of their satisfaction with it. And to a person, they were very high in their praise. Now, that requires stellar folks like, like Rob Davis to be there. But if I think about the preparation for Cornell to really move toward a collective collection, I'd spend all of my money on agriculture and on industrial labor relations and things that complement Columbia's holdings, and there's not a chance in my lifetime that that will happen. So being able to think not only collective collections, but collective services on top of that will be key. So that as we expose our agriculture, excuse me, collection to the Columbia faculty as they think about sustainability, that kind of, of, of um, collective services there is really an important thing for them. While I walk this gavel over to Winston, and we speculate about what he's going to do with it, Deborah has a comment. Yeah, we, um, this is all reminding me of our collective collection with UNC Chapel Hill, which we've had for 90 years, collectively developed collections. We've had a shared South Asia librarian for eight or nine years. Um, and, but I want to raise the issue of faculty uh, recruitment when you have shared collections. And we've had some cases where, you know, the faculty member comes to interview at Duke or UNC and is told, well, you know, we have this great cooperative thing. Your collection is in Chapel Hill. And they say, what? No, in my field? 
So it can be a recruitment barrier, or it can be, we've had the other experience of, that's great, what a wonderful use of your resources. Um, I'm glad you can collectively have a much richer array of, of things. So, but it's still the issue of uh, status and how regarded that particular field is by the library and by the university. Thank you for listening. Music was provided by Josh Woodward. For more talks from this meeting, please visit www.arl.org.